God, invisible God, immortal God, how great thou art, immortal, immortal God, invisible God, immortal God. How great thou art, immortal, immortal God, invisible God, immortal God, how great thou art. Our Father and our God, the one who lives forever, the one who has no beginning, therefore has no ending. The ancient of days, we worship you. We thank you for what you did in our lives yesterday. We thank you in advance for what you will do today. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you will continue with us. And you will draw us even closer to yourself than ever before. So that at the end of this minister's conference, all of us will be able to say, definitely, we have been with Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Let someone shout hallelujah. <clears throat> well, we want to thank the almighty God for everything we learned yesterday. Um, we'll be continuing with our text in Second Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Second Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Now Elisha was falling sick of a sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Yesterday we shared with you how we spent three years studying Elijah before we switched over to studying Elisha, his son, his greater son. I'm sure probably some of us will say, but you didn't tell us much about what you learned from Elijah yesterday. Well, um, it's not easy to share what you learned in three years in one moment. But apart from the fact that I said that Elijah taught me uh, to know when to stay to fight and when to run, there are some very, very crucial things about Elijah um, and I've just mentioned maybe just two of them. Number one, of course, is that he's what I would call a yes man when it comes to himself and God. Whatever God says to him is yes, Lord. Go to the palace, yes, Lord. Get out of the palace and go to uh, the book of Cherith. Yes, Lord. Go and stay with a widow who had just one son as Chepron. Yes, Lord. Go and show yourself to Ahab, even though he's been looking for you to kill you. Yes, Lord. He is a yes man. And I have learned that if I can just say yes, Lord, uh, I will prosper mightily. If God says stay here today, I will stay. Go, I will go. 
um, I have discovered that probably on one or two occasions when I tried to argue, I paid for it. I can give you one illustration very quickly. I went to my hometown on holidays and uh, they prepared me my favorite pounded yam with, oh, well, very wonderful uh, bush meat. And as I sat down, this is food prepared in my home by my people. So I'm sure there's no poison there. As I was about to begin to eat, I heard the Lord loud and clear, don't eat yet. <laughs> and of course I argued, I'm not fasting. I've already eaten breakfast. And in any case, I'm on holidays. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I ate. I finished eating the pandediam when a message came that my elder sister was sick, desperately sick. I drove there and saw that he, she was covered from head to toe with smallpox. I'm talking of several years ago. It was even before I became general overseer. When I saw her, I mean, you don't attack smallpox with your stomach full of pandemia. <laughs> I understood immediately why God said don't eat yet. I ran into the bush behind the house, put my hand in my throat and forced the food out. I just give you that a sim simple example so we understand what it is to be a yes man. Sit down, yes, Lord. Stand up, yes, Lord. Go, yes, Lord. Eat, yes, Lord. Don't eat, yes, Lord. Sleep, yes, Lord. Don't sleep yet, yes, Lord. Elijah was a yes man. He taught me that one. The second thing I discovered about him that is very basic is that he practically spent quality time with God. Any time is not on the mountain calling fire down from heaven or delivering a message from the Lord. He was with God. As a matter of fact, we, are, uh, we met him for the first time in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. 1 Kings 17, verse 1. He said, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. Oh, he knew how to fellowship with God. He spent time with God. It was from him that I learned that the time you spend alone with God is not wasted time. As a matter of fact, that's probably the best time ever you can spend. Because it prepares you for whatever is ahead. But that's on Elijah. Um, if God wants me to tell you everything I learned about him, it will create a time for us to discuss Elijah. We are discussing Elisha. Yesterday we found out who Elisha was. But in this passage, he says, now Elisha was falling sick of his sickness whereof he died. Elisha was healthy. He was a healthy man. The only time he fell sick was also the time he died. He was very healthy because he was highly anointed. I mean, there was enough anointing in him that when you, when you look at the story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38 to 41, 
2 Kings 4, 38 to 41, when he asked uh, one of his servants to prepare food for the others, and somebody went out and brought some uh, fruits from the field, not knowing that it's poisonous, and added it to the food. The moment they told him, sir, there is death in the pot, he said, oh, that's no problem, bring me some flour. As soon as the flower touched his hand, the, the flower became a poison neutralizer. He threw this flower into the pot and death vanished from the pot. There was so much anointing on Elisha, so you, you understand why I love him so much. That in 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7, 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7, as soon as a piece of wood touched his hand, he threw it into the river Jordan, the wood sank instead of floating. Got to the bottom of river Jordan, located the axe head that has fallen to the bottom, transferred a bit of the anointing to the axe head, and the axe head jumped up to the top of the river and started flowing, I mean floating. Oh, he was anointed. <laughs> there was no sickness that could stay on his body. And I, I think I've told you so, so, something that happened several years ago when some young men went to uh, a creek area to go and, and witness. And they were spending the day, uh, the night, in uh, a primary school there. And in the evening, while they were trying to sleep, mosquitoes were zooming on everybody. So they were all slapping themselves. And but this brother remained cool. And so cool that the others were compelled to ask him, Sir, the mosquitoes are not troubling you. He said, Me, mosquitoes? They touch me, they die. So he stretched forth his hand and said, Watch. And as he stretched forth his hand, mosquitoes gathered on his bare hand. And as they were watching, one by one, the mosquitoes dropped down dead. That was the kind of anointing that I heard about when I was a very young Christian. A kind of anointing that can kill any mosquito <laughs> that dares come near it. And I probably told you about somebody too, these are true stories, who was sitting in, in a uh, school classroom, school hall about to teach, and uh, the, the windows were open. And then one sister went behind him and laid his hand on his head and said, I claim you for my husband. As soon as her hands touched, he said, a force that nobody can see picked her up and threw her out of the window. Now that's anointing. That's the kind of anointing I hungered for. You find that kind of anointing with uh, Elisha. Now, here the Bible now said, he was sick. When you go to the scriptures, you will discover that none of the apostles was sick. Not one. Because in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 to 15, Matthew 8, 14 to 15, the Bible told us about the mother-in-law of Peter having fever. And Jesus healed her. If any of the apostles had been sick, if the Bible can tell us of the fever of a mother-in-law, he would have told us about the day that Peter developed headache, or John had stomachache. Or... No. They were healthy throughout. Many words, sir, Amma, you don't have to be sick ever again. But if you ever 
fall sick. All you have to do is to reach out for the stripes. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. First Peter 2 verse 24 tells us that by his stripes we were healed. If you reach out for the stripes, if you claim your healing by the stripes, and for one reason or the other you don't get well, there must be something wrong. And according to James chapter 5 verse 16, James 5 16, if that happened, there must be a fault in you. And he said, you confess the faults one to another that you may be healed. Now you say, sir, if I don't have to be sick, and I'm decreeing the name that's above every other name, that every one of you who might be in, form of, in any form of sickness right now, be healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. If I don't need to be sick, then how do I die? You don't have to be sick to die. Second Peter chapter 1, from verse 13 to 14, Second Peter 1, verse 13 to 14, tells us that all you need to do is just put off this tabernacle of flesh. Just slip out of this body and be gone. Okay, so Elisha fell sick. And then he died. Now remember I said yesterday that this is minister's conference. It's not Sunday school stuff. Because now we want to begin to go into some deep waters. We want to talk about death. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Hebrews 9 27 made it clear. It is appointed unto man wants to die. After that, judgment. Now I agree with those who say, oh, no, that does not mean that everybody will have to keep that appointment. I am not arguing with you over that. After all, the rapture may come. If the rapture comes, we go. If the Lord delays his coming, brother, sister, <laughs> you and I, we die one day. Death is no respecter of anointing. Death is no respecter of anointing. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 1. 1 Samuel 25 verse 1 tells us that Samuel died. Samuel. Samuel the king maker. 1 Kings chapter 16 from verse 1 to 13. 1 Kings 16 from verse 1 to 13. The, the, Samuel who was so mighty that whenever he comes to a town, the elders would tremble. The elders of the town will tremble until they know whether he has come in peace or he has come to pronounce judgment. He died. Samuel, the king remover, not just a king maker, he was a king remover. First Kings chapter 15 from verse 22 to 29. First Kings 15, 22 to 29. When King Saul misbehaved, he removed him. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 8. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 8 says, Nobody has power in the day of death. It doesn't matter how anointed you say you are. When the day comes to go, you go. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26. Because there are some people who say, oh, No, no, no. When you are teaching like that, you are dwelling on... Uh, uh, Old Testament times. Ah. It's appointed unto man who wants to die. It's in the New Testament, not in the Old. 
And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, made it clear. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. Death is not a respecter of anointing. Let's get that one clear. Let's get it clear that death is not a function of age. It doesn't say that uh, it will kill only old people. <laughs> it can kill anybody. You could leave the father and kill the son. We've seen it before. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, Moses lived to be 120. And he remained vigorous. In Joshua 24, verse 29, Joshua 24, verse 29, Joshua, who took over from Moses, died at the age of 110. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 27, Genesis 5, verse 27. There was this man called Methuselah who lived for 969 years. Funny man, Methuselah. <laughs> Each time I, I, I talked about him, I just wonder, what was he doing for 969 years? Nothing. He just ate and begat. Was just, he was just old for nothing. But uh, like I've always said, I sympathize with him because uh, I think he got married around the age of 187 or so. <laughs> so if a man married at the age of 187, uh, he deserves some extra time. In Psalm 91 from verse 14 to 16, Psalm 91 from verse 14 to 16, the promise of God is that with long life, it will satisfy you. That's what he promised. But that you are not going to die, if the Lord tarries, you must be deceiving yourself. Even those who were sick and were healed, we see that. Even those who were raised from the dead, they will see that. For example, where is Lazarus? The Lord raised him after four days, John 11, 39 to 45. John 11, 39 to 45. The Lord Jesus Christ himself brought him back after he's been dead for four days, but dead and buried for four days. And yet, he died. I'm sure you say, sir, why are you talking about death? Because the important thing we should be asking ourselves is not whether we are going to die or not. It is, how much time have I left? Remember, death is not a function of age. How much time have I left? According to Job chapter 14, verse 1, Job chapter 14, verse 1, he said, A man born of a woman is of few days. If that is true, <laughs> out of the few days, we have all spent a lot. In John chapter 9, verse 4, John chapter 9, verse 4, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Hey, the night is coming when no man can walk. How much time have I left? Settle down to, to the fact that you're going to die. You don't know when. But how much time have I left? Because this is necessary to enable you to discuss with yourself the issue of finishing. You will go as soon as you have finished the assignment God has given you. For example, take John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, from verse 19 to 36, John 1, 19 to 36, they sent to him, 
Hey, who are you? He said, I'm the voice. I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. He said, that's my assignment. That's what I came to do. Then he saw the Lord Jesus Christ come and say, Ah, behold the Lamb of God. I take it away the sin of the world. Assignment completed. So in Matthew, Matthew chapter 14 from verse 1 to 13, Matthew 14 from verse 1 to 13, the Lord was around when they were planning to cut off this man's head. He did nothing about it. Why? Because he has finished his assignment. But more important to us, brethren, is not just finishing, but finishing well. Finishing well. Like Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 6 to 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 6 to 8. He said, I, I finished well. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you don't finish well, then that's, that's terrible. In Deuteronomy 34, from verse 1 to 8, Deuteronomy 34, from verse 1 to 8, this Moses, who lived for you to be 120, if you read that passage, in verse 4 there, God said, I've shown you the land that I will promise to give to the children of Israel, but you are not going in with them. That must have been a very sad day for Moses. He labored for 40 years. And God says, you are not going in. I pray for every one of you listening to me. May the almighty God help you to finish well. What about Joshua? Who lived to be 110? Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. Joshua 13 verse 1. The Almighty God said, ha, Joshua, you are old. And yet there is still much land to be possessed. I told you in Joshua 1 that you are the one who would distribute the land to the people. You are old, Joshua. And you haven't finished your assignment. Brethren, we're talking now of the roles that God will want each and every one of us to play. Finishing well has nothing to do with titles. God will give you your own assignment and expect you to finish that assignment and finish it well. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11 to 13, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, it tells us there are some who are apostles, some who are prophets, some who are evangelists, some who are pastors, some who are teachers. Each one has his own role. Fingers are not created equal, but each finger has its own assignment. In 2 Kings chapter 5, if you read from verse 1 to 19, 2 Kings chapter 5 from verse 1 to 19, the Bible tells us about a housemaid, actually a slave, in the house of Naaman. It was the role of that girl to connect Naaman to Elisha. And when she did, and Naaman got healed, Naaman brought Christianity or the worship of Jehovah to Syria. Elisha had his own part. Gehazi had his own part to go and tell the fellow to go and jump in the river. 
the servant of Naaman had his own part. But this maid, whose name was not even given, was the crucial fellow who set the ball rolling. Roll. His name wasn't, her name wasn't even mentioned. She's not a prophet. She's not one of the sons of the prophet. Just a maid. In John chapter 6, from verse 5 to 13, John 6, from verse 5 to 13, when the Lord needed food to feed the multitude, the Bible said there was a lad there. He didn't give us his name. They didn't call him one of the apostles. Just a small boy. He gave his lunch to Jesus Christ. And the people were fed. Some of you will know this fellow. Who was just a driver. Nothing more. Just a driver. And... The wife of the master was having some problems, and this driver said to her, the church I go to, miracles are happening there. Maybe if you come along. And she said, okay, drive me there. She came. She gave her life to Jesus. God solved the problem. Ah, so she said, my sister also had a big problem. So she brought the sister God solved the problem of the sister. And the sister was the one who said, this church must come to my town. She gave a house. I said, take my house, take this house, start the church there. The church started there. That house filled very rapidly. So she gave a second house. And then she gave a third and today, in that state, <laughs> we have more than a thousand parishes. When God begins to reward people, he will reward the woman who gave houses for her sacrifice. But he will reward the driver who set the ball rolling. Success is doing what God assigns to you very well. Take note of that. You see, because when you read the story of my, in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 14 to 30, Matthew 25 from verse 14 to 30, it, the Bible tells us that God gave one fellow five talents to another two talents. To another one. And said, go ahead. Occupy till I come. He came back. The one who got five had increased his five to ten. He had doubled. <laughs> doubled. When the Lord was speaking to him, he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. When the one who got two came, he also doubled. His own two had become four. God said the same thing to him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God didn't say to the one who had two, why have you remained only at four? Can't you see your friend, had, your friend had gone up to ten? But you know the result of the one who got one. Got upset. He gave five to one, two to another. Gave me only one. And he expressed me to multiply. As many of us Probably might have been saying, I hope it is not, I hope I'm wrong. Don't mind the general overseer. He sits down at the camp, saying he multiply. He, should, he doesn't know the situation around here. Uh, number one, you are wrong. He doesn't sit down at the camp. 
<laughs> probably if, if there's anything to thank God for coronavirus is that I have been compelled to sit down at home. If you, if you see the, my life, if you see the way I move, if you see the, the intensity of my running up and down, you won't say that I ask you to do a big thing when all I ask you to do is just double. What I'm saying is this. It, God knows how much you are capable of doing. He's not going to ask for more than double from you. He will give you the same reward. Well done. Enter into the joy of your Lord that he gives to the one who had five talents. Now, we can't talk about death without talking about heaven. So I want to talk a little bit about heaven, to just to give you a glimpse. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 1, Isaiah 66 verse 1, God said, heaven is my throne. If that is the only thing said about heaven, you should know that heaven must be beautiful. God won't sit down in a place that is dirty or ugly. <laughs> you know, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, Daniel 2, verse 20 to 22, that wisdom belongs to God. This all-wise God decided to design a place for himself where he will sit, where he will put his throne. <laughs> if you are a master architect, what will the design of your house be like? Because Hebrews 11 verse 8 to 10, Hebrews 11 verse 8 to 10, talking about Abraham, told us, he was looking for a city whose maker and builder is God. God is the architect and the builder of heaven. And you know, if you want to see how, if a man wants to show you how rich he is, he lavishes his wealth on his house. Because a rich man can't write on in the front of his head and say, I have so many billions in the back. No. And he, it doesn't matter how many cars he has, he can only ride one at a time. That's why you find that rich people go to a great extent in building their accommodation, their, the place where they will come to rest. Can you imagine how beautiful will be the residence of the one who is all sufficient? Revelation, I mean, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. I told you before of a friend of mine, I visited his house and I have seen houses. I'm telling you, I've traveled the world. And I've seen houses. When I go to his house, I, I open my mouth involuntarily. He noticed my surprise. He says, Daddy, the only thing in this house that is not imported is sand. Everything else you see here, imported. Why? Because money was of no consequence when you are truly rich you will tell those the builders don't worry about money just build on the one who says silver is mine gold is mine built a place for himself that's why the bible said the streets were made of gold 
That's not all about heaven. There's one beautiful thing again about heaven. Revelation 21 verse 25. Revelation 21 verse 25. The Bible calls it the land of the endless day. There is no night there. You know the beauty of that? Have you ever had a great celebration? You know, maybe uh, your birthday. Your birthday is coming. And there have been a lot of preparations. Maybe uh, it's a special birthday. You are turning 40 or whatever. And for a whole month, there have been preparations. We will, we will do this, we will do that. And then the great day came, and you woke up with people singing, happy birthday, and you are happy. But before you know it, the night comes. <laughs> The celebration is over. And the next morning, you wake up to discover hey, the celebration had ended yesterday. But in heaven, the celebration will never end. Because there's no night there. And one other beautiful thing about heaven that I will mention. Is according to Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. Revelation 22, verse 5. The Bible says, there's no sun there. Because God himself is the one who supplying the light. You know the meaning of that? There won't be a case of power failure. Not only that, the temperature, temperature there is always constant. Never too hot. Never too cold. That is why those who have had the opportunity of getting just a glimpse of heaven will tell you it's a better place to be than the earth. Uh, the wisest man apart from the Lord Jesus Christ who ever lived, Solomon, said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, you will wonder, what, what's this man say? Oh, he said the good name is far better than precious oil. And then he said the day of death is far better than the day of birth. That's amazing, isn't it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, Paul, who had had opportunity of getting a glimpse, you know, he, he told us, whether out of the body or in the body, he had been transported to the third heavens. He's, he saw things that he cannot even describe, no words to describe them. He said he would rather be absent <clears throat> from the body and be present with the Lord. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, Philippians 1, 21 to 23, Oh, he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, I desire to depart. To be with Christ, which will be far better. There must be something he saw that is causing him to say that. But then he made it easier for us to understand. You know, in Second Timothy chapter 4, from verse 6 to 8, when, when he was saying, now I'm ready to go, I've, uh, I've finished my assignment, I'm about to go. He made it clear to us that when you die, you are going for graduation, coronation, prize giving day. I mean, you know how happy you are if those of you who have been to the university, after suffering for your years, finally you passed, and it is graduation day, and you bring your friends, you bring your relatives, and, uh, and then you dress in that very special dress, and throughout that day you are just beaming with joy. Ask a king, a traditional ruler 
How do you feel on the day of your coronation? And they will tell you. As the president, how do you feel when they, the day they swore you in, particularly if it's the first time? It will be difficult for him to describe. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, that when you live here, you go before the judgment seat of God, of Christ, to receive prizes, to be rewarded for what you have done. And that's not all. That's not all that makes heaven so beautiful. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, At long last, we will see him as he is. Very few people can say that they have ever seen Jesus in a vision. Oh, there are some, <laughs> some crooks who will say that they see Jesus in vision every, every night. I don't mind them. But on that day, when you live here, you will see him as he is. As a matter of fact, just by, before you close your eyes, he will be standing by your side. Because he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When I finish preparing the place, I will come back and take you to myself. But there's still something else, something else about heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 9 to 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 9 to 10, the, the, the Bible talks about certain things that eyes have never seen, ears have never heard, they have never entered into the thought of a man. The things that God had prepared for those who love him. There will be surprises that day. There are certain things God had prepared for you because you are serving him that will be revealed to you on that day. I wish you would lay your hands on my book on Revelation, the book of Revelation. Because I explained there to you certain things that will happen to those who overcome. And one of the things that will be given to overcomers is a wise stone on which a name is written. And nobody knows the name except the one who receives it. I'm wondering what name God is going to write on my wise stone. When, when we leave this place, when we Put out, when we put down this uh, uh, tabernacle of flesh, uh, there will be nothing hidden anymore. So, what are we to do? I hope you are not thinking that I'm asking you to get ready to die. <laughs> but to tell you the truth. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because any of us can go at any moment. Any moment. So, what must I do to be ready for heaven? In Matthew 25 from verse 1 to 13, Matthew 25 from verse 1 to 13, the Bible tells us the story of the ten virgins. They were virgins from good homes. They were well taught. They were doers of what they were taught. They attended a very good church. Virgins, chosen out of many, ten of them. But only five got in. Five were locked out. So, what is the first thing I must do? I must be extra ready. Extra ready. 
There will be people who will be telling you, and I'm sure you've had it again and again, say that your own is too much. That we are making the journey to heaven too tough for you in the redeemed Christian church of God. Mm. You must be extra ready. And one important point, very, very crucial point, according to Revelation 22 from verse 14 to 15, Revelation 22 from verse 14 to 15, you must stop lying in any form. Because without are liars. Don't let anybody tell you that because you are in the age of grace, therefore you could tell white lies or business lies or any form of lies at all. And you know what? Exaggeration is a lie. False reports are lies. If you don't believe me, ask Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5 from verse 1 to 11. Acts 5, 1 to 11. Is this all you sold the land for? You say, yes. Ah. Why has the devil filled your heart to lie? The reports you feel. about attendance, particularly when you are trying to maneuver yourself into becoming a province, who shut the door of heaven against you. The reports will feel, financial reports, anything other than the absolute truth it's a lie. Don't let money take you away from heaven. The report you give concerning a fellow brother you think he did this? I mean, you say he did this when he didn't do it. Lies. What do I do to be ready for heaven? Restitute your ways. Make peace with all men. And it doesn't matter what anybody may be teaching. It doesn't matter what anybody may be teaching. According to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14... Hebrews 12, verse 14, and Hebrews is in the New Testament, not in the Old. It is holiness or hell. There's no middle way in between. Holiness or hell. What do I do so that I'll be able to make it to heaven? Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Hold fast to what you have. Let no man take your crown. Oh, you say, but uh, I mean, uh, there are so many other churches. They teach. I am not concerned about other churches. I'm only concerned about you, my children. You are the ones I'm talking to because I want to see you in heaven. Hold fast to what you have, the old time religion. What do I do so I can make it to heaven? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and the Lord will give you a crown of life. Or 
What do I do to make it to heaven? Peter told us, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14. He said, <laughs> Beloved, are you looking forward? He said, you better be diligent to be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. Because it is written in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 is in the New Testament. Written Ephesians, the, 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 the letter to the Ephesians is the greatest book on grace. And it's there that it is written, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, the Lord is called blemish. As the church is coming for. Because we don't know when our own home call will be. We don't know. Because we don't know when our own home call will be. We don't know. And it's good that we don't know. You say, how can, you say, how can, how can it be good? The difference between us and those who have been sentenced to death in the court of judgment is that the one who is sentenced to death has a rough idea that uh, it will soon go. And we, we don't know. But we are all sentenced to death. It's appointed unto man who wants to die. And remember what I said. You don't have to be sick to die. I'm sure you will remember at least one or two cases who are either very close to you or related to somebody or the other. You will remember the case of a brother who was watching the television. I was abroad. I was conducting a Holy Ghost service and it was being relayed all over the world. So he was watching the program with his wife, sitting down on the sofa. The wife also there. No struggle, no pain. Program was over. The wife turned. Darling, can we go and sleep? Darling was gone. <laughs> was a great friend of mine, so I, I mean, that's what I expected would happen to him. No pain, no struggle, no carrying from one hospital to the other. And then I'll give you another example. This one directly connected to me, an uncle of mine. No sickness, nothing. Thanksgiving Sunday, he went to church, sang, danced, ministered, got home, took a little bit of breakfast because the wife was going to prepare his favorite pounded yam. They were already pounding the yam when he decided to go to the toilet to ease himself. They finished pounding the yam. The wife came and said, uh, darling, come out. The food is ready. No answer. By the time they opened the door, <laughs> Dali was sitting on the toilet seat and gone. No notice. No struggle. Nothing. Only God, only God knows how many of us will be around by tomorrow morning. Only God knows. That is why you must spend quality time tonight settling your situation with God. Not only must you cry to him for total cleansing, cry unto him and ask for revelation of 
issues you need to restitute about. Please do so. Because any time he may come. And that's why those of you who are married must not go to bed without settling any quarrel between you and your husband. I mean, I know some of you ministers, you are husband, minister, the wife, a minister. You can't afford to go to bed without settling your misunderstanding because, hey, there is no guarantee that either of you will be awake by tomorrow. And we don't have to sorrow for those who have gone to heaven. If we should sorrow at all, it will be, we should be sorrowing for ourselves. I know you will ask me, Daddy, have you, have you got a glimpse of heaven? <laughs> I have. I don't have time to tell you the details about that. But if, if you get a glimpse of heaven, it's, it's very difficult to describe I was once asked to at least give an illustration, no matter how poor. And I told them, well, I remember the first time I went to America. It was in July 1979. And uh, summer over there, I went to Tulsa. And that year, Tulsa was one of the, was number three cleanest city in America. They wash the street every day. So that if your food fell down, you can pick it up and continue to eat. We stayed in an hotel where the faucet had three outlets. One is giving you a normal room temperature water. One is giving you hot water. The other is giving you ice water. The, 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 the light never blimp at all. And I left from Moshio, don't forget. <laughs> and light didn't go because it was summer. The sun didn't set until around 10 p.m. Talk about the, 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 the day, uh, uh, an endless day. I was there for two weeks. Oh, it was wonderful. Then the time came to return home. <laughs> and when we got to Ikeja, I said, fasten your seatbelt. I looked out of the window and I saw Moshi. And I said, oh God, back to prison. And that's a very poor illustration. I've told people before, if God shows you heaven, the only thing that will prevent you from committing suicide is because you know if you kill yourself, you will miss it. There's no place as beautiful as heaven. But don't miss it. Because if you miss heaven, you go straight to hell. And I want to see you in heaven. And by the special grace of God, I will see you there. Amen. Let me pray for you before you begin to pray for yourself. Ancient of days, I want to thank you once again for your word. I pray that the Holy Spirit will take this word set it on fire and put it in the hearts of your children who have had me so that everything that they need to put right in their lives every restitution that they need to make so that they won't miss heaven they'll be able to do so I pray Lord God Almighty that this message will transform their lives and that in heaven I will be there with them reigning with you forever. Amen. Thank you, my Father and my God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, you're at home. Like I said yesterday, you're not going anywhere. Make sure you spend quality time during this period talking to the Almighty God. And He will grant your request in Jesus' name.